You're listening to episode 154, Recovering the Pieces of Your Life After Trauma, with Lisbeth Meredith. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome, and thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the podcast. I'm so grateful to have you here. And today we're going to be joined by Lisbeth Meredith, author of Pieces of Me, Rescuing My Kidnapped Daughters. Before we get into it, I want to let you know that this episode is sponsored by Navni. Navni is the top-ranked anonymous writing website in the world. Navni provides free wellness resources and low-cost online therapy services to help people cope with various levels of emotional distress. Write anonymously feel better at novni.com. Lisbeth is an award-winning author and juvenile probation supervisor, and she joins us today to talk about how she has navigated multiple traumas in her life, including the kidnapping of her daughters, to find a way to heal and help others who are struggling with their own trauma. And in particular, she's going to talk about her experiences growing up in a chaotic home and the abusive relationship that she experienced as an adult and the ordeal that she experienced of her daughters being kidnapped, and how the kidnapping made her look more closely at her own trauma growing up. And she'll also talk about what life was like when she came home with her daughters. And she'll talk about the importance of being trauma-informed when helping someone who is hurting. And she'll talk about the work that she's done in the trauma field, as well as the role that the support of others has played in her life and also the struggle that she still has in being in a relationship. So Lisbeth's story is an incredible one of healing, and I encourage you to listen if you're feeling alone in what you're going through and can use some inspiration. And so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get into this one, and I'll go bring Lisbeth on. Lisbeth, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining me here today to share your story with us. Thank you so much for having me, Melissa. I'm really excited to be on the Grass Gets Greener. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here as well. And so, you know, you and I got connected through recent past guests of this uh, show, Lisa Boucher, and I'm glad that she made the connection because you have quite the story to share with us. And when you had reached out to me, you said that trauma was your middle name. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I know that you've experienced a lot of trauma in your life uh, from when you were a child and as an adult as well. And so we'll touch upon all of that as we go through your journey here today. And you've been doing some great work in the trauma field as well. So, Lizbeth, I'd love to have you start us out by sharing a little bit about um, your childhood and the trauma that you experienced at that time. And then we'll go from there if that sounds good to you. That sounds wonderful. And again, thank you, Melissa, for having me. And thank you to wonderful uh, Lisa Boucher for referring me. When I was a kid, I live in Anchorage, Alaska, but when I was a kid, I lived all over in different homes in Alaska, but I lived in a really chaotic home. And sometimes there was screaming, sometimes kids would be passing by our house and my urine stained mattress would be pushed outside as a shaming mechanism because my mother was certain that I wet my bed to hurt her. And we had, there was violence, there were kids disappearing. I was from a large family. I was the first dark headed kid, and at least that I knew of in the family that I grew up in. And I always felt like an outsider. And I knew a couple of things as a very small child. I knew that I would never be a kid who would subject my children to divorces. And I always knew I wanted to be a parent. That was early, early on. I wanted to be a mom but I was certain I could do better than my family had. There wouldn't be divorces. There wouldn't be domestic violence that some of the kids had, some of us kids had been exposed to. There wouldn't be parental kidnappings. As I later learned, we had been subjected to. My kids would grow up with their name and they would know both parents. And it was really important for me to just hold on to that dream. I mean, I was a very judgmental little girl 
but I thought I could do better than this. I will do better than this. And I was an angry and sometimes very troubled kid, a bullied child in school at different points. Not all through. I had some wonderful friends at different spots. But it's easy to target someone who is clearly vulnerable. And at times in my childhood, I was very, very vulnerable and feeling alone. And then lo and behold, my good intentions didn't mean enough because not long after I left the nest, my siblings just kept disappearing and I didn't know what was happening to us. I didn't know the brothers that I knew I was born with. I didn't know where to find them. I didn't know if my father was still alive. My mother later told me in life that that I had a dad. He was probably maybe still alive. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe one day I should look him up. So launching into early adulthood, I had a lot on my mind, but I just wanted out. And so I went away to college for a bit and made a big mess there. And then soon enough, found someone back in Alaska who appeared to be totally interested in everything about me and who wanted to just kind of rescue me from my situation, love me, gave me all kinds of promises of a hopeful future together. And Just a few years after that, I was looking all over the world, really, but looking in Europe for my kidnapped daughters. I had had a couple of daughters, and not only did I not hold to my good intentions and find a wonderful, stable household and make one for them, but I had to flee after a violent situation in 1990, took my daughters to the shelter there, the Battered Women's Shelter, Domestic Violence Agency in Anchorage, and there started to rebuild my life. Unfortunately, what I didn't know then about how abusive relationships work is that if you upend someone's power and control who loves to have power and control, the paybacks can be very deadly Hmm. and long-term. And so I left in 1990 with my good intentions and my beautiful little girls. One was 10 months old, the other was two turning three. And four years later, four long years, I had clawed to get on public assistance, get off public assistance, get my journalism degree, get out of assisted living, just try to be an independent parent on $10 an hour and getting no child support. And it was four years later that he really Uh, did the thing that was worse than killing me, which was taking our daughters and disappearing out of the country. And two years later, I reunited with my non-English speaking girls. Mm. And at that point, the real work began. And I know you went through quite the ordeal with that. It was, it was quite the ordeal. And I, I would just say that while I was looking for my daughters, I really had to take stock of how I had gotten to that point. And I, I think there are people who grow up with strong enough constitutions that just, no matter what they'd been through, no matter what kind of awful inheritances that they may have received from their families, they could be that different person straight away. But for me, it took a lot more mining my history to find out how I had made the certain choices I had and getting into that relationship Figuring out who I was, what my strengths are, and accepting my many weaknesses, and realizing that I did deserve better. I really did, and so did my daughters. Mm-hmm. And so getting, finding my children was largely saving myself and finding myself in the process, and I had a whole lot of help. So that's kind of the story in a nutshell. And it, I would have thought that it just wrapped in a bow happily ever after when my kids and I got off the plane from Greece actually from Turkey at that point, but, and came back home to Anchorage, Alaska. And we received a hero's welcome and news cameras, all of that. It was a big, big deal in the time, but really the hard work was straight ahead. It was finding my lost children with nothing. It was healing from trauma for all of us. That was the real journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can only imagine. And now, you know, given what you had gone through as a child yourself, and then, you know, it being compounded by what you experienced later on as an adult. I mean, that just makes things that much more worse, doesn't it? 
it, it, it does make it hard because what you have is a trauma, a traumatized child who never really healed raising children who now are so traumatized. And, and how so, are you doing, how are you doing, you know, before the kidnapping happened? How, how are you at that point in your life? I felt fabulous. I mean, I felt like I'd gone to a lot of therapy. I've, I've been a big believer in counseling since before I reached high school. And I think I was the first blabbermouth in my family <laughs> who would see a counselor and guy. Well, I was, uh, and I think to, to some extent, I still am. I'm the, the whistleblower, you know, and I wanted to find somebody to hear the craziness that was going on in my life. And so I always had a strong belief in therapy that nobody had role modeled in my family to me. Um, and so after I left my former husband, I went to therapy and my children went to play therapy. And, you know, I did a lot of recovery work. I went to, and I am a big believer in peer support groups of every kind. I went to parenting, single parenting support group. I went to the uh, domestic violence victims information support groups that I could learn from other people who'd gone through my experiences. I think that's so important. It's great to have trained professionals. In addition, it's wonderful to have peer support. Mm -hmm. And so I went through those groups, graduated from college, felt like I was on top of the world. I mean, you would have thought I was just wealthy on $10 an hour, but I got a job working at the very place that had helped save our lives. And so I got to put at that point, while my kids were real tiny, put to use some of the amazing and horrible experiences we'd had. I got to put it to work giving trainings to law enforcement, to judges across the state, to educators, just talking about the impact. And this was in the early 90s at that point. The impact of domestic violence and the community response and how we can help one another to be safe, to be sane, and to avoid violence or get out of violence safely. It was the best feeling in the world. And so by the time 1994 came and my kids were kidnapped, I had long felt like a survivor. And mm -hmm. then there I was working with fellow victims of domestic violence and my kids were kidnapped. Mm. So it was, it was good that I had a whole lot of emotional muscle, but it was really hard to realize that my daughters were paying the ultimate price for my decision to leave. And mm -hmm. that was just incredibly painful. I don't think that my former husband realized that I had by then had a lot of muscle, emotional muscle underneath what looked like a very vulnerable young person. By the time he took the girls and, and kidnapped them, I was 29. And I'd already been out of that relationship for four years. But I knew that I had a wonderful support group through work and through my amazing community in Anchorage. And I knew that I had gone through so much already and that if I could just recover my daughters, that that would be the end of my relationship with him. This would put it to the to end once and for all. And uh, I just kept holding that image ahead of myself that this is how it's going to be when I get off the plane and thank people for their help. This is what it's going to be like to raise children without the constant intimidation of their father. This is what it's going to feel like to move forward. This is what it's going to feel like to write a book one day about our experiences so that others can understand the recovery from trauma process and how it worked for us anyhow. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you were doing pretty well up until the kidnapping happened and you had done some healing from your past traumas. Um, so then when this happened, how, how did that end up affecting you? And like, in what ways did that um, you know, sort of trigger you or re-traumatize you from what you had experienced before? Were there things that came up that you realized that, you know, you still had to deal with maybe that you hadn't deal dealt with yet and um, only through this you were able to, to see those things? Yes. I would say even in the writing process, there were certain things I'd never seen before. When the kids were taken in March of 1994, I mean, that was that was all I had. I wasn't remarried and I never actually did remarry. I didn't have 
pets. I didn't have a close family at, at uh, around me. I hardly knew my father's side of the family, but I had already reunited with him by then. But I didn't know that side of the family then, and there was nothing that they, nothing could be done about that. They couldn't do anything if they had been able, in the position to help. There was not much they could do from where they lived in Kentucky. But I did. I started seeing oh my gosh, you know, I mean, us kids disappearing all over the map, the kids that I grew up with, uh, there were more children for me to meet later, um, but them disappearing, my father disappearing, me growing up with a name that wasn't mine, all of those things, those were absolutely wrong. And I had always looked for a tribe to belong to. I never felt like I belonged. And it kind of made sense that when I met someone who was Greek from, and I'm not suggesting in my story that, that he represented all Greeks whatsoever. I just need to be clear. I met the wrong person. I met a very abusive person that I worked with who was older than myself. But when I met him and he had such a strong sense of cultural connection, such pride in generations deep of his family, that was so appealing because I felt invisible. I still felt invisible. And so just kind of going back and autopsying that relationship and my childhood and how I got to the place that I was, it really was telling. And some of that I had to put on the back burner because that wasn't the time for me to really kind of feel things. I developed a very detached way of dealing. So the very day that I realized my children were out of the country, when I'd finally called the police and at first they didn't want to help, I kept bothering them and saying, look, I'm supposed to pick up my children from the daycare where my former husband is supposed to have dropped them off, but he's nowhere to be found. I couldn't help them understand at first how serious this felt to me based on our history. And once they were able to confirm my kids were out of the country, I still that very next morning went to work as planned. I did not miss a beat because I already knew that for me, and I think for a lot of people, if you've grown up in chaos, one of the healthiest things for us is structure. And work provided a sense of family and structure that I needed. And so I did not sleep all night long and I made the appropriate phone calls. And yet I still showed up to work the place that had given me so much. And the place where I needed support. And that began, it kind of set the tone for how trying to get my children out of, wrenching them out of a foreign country would go. I, I still held myself pretty accountable to the certain things. And I once had a friend tell me in the middle of all this mess, um, and I think this was before uh, my well, no, it was actually after he, my former husband kidnapped our daughters. He, he was not supposed to ever have permission to take them out of the state, out of the country. He didn't visit often. So this was a very dramatic move. And I was going to bore everyone who I knew talking about it constantly if I wasn't careful. And a friend of mine said to me early enough on, she was very empathetic, but she also said, you know, you need to give yourself a, a, a worry hour. And, and I can't remember, now that I'm thinking about this, did she say this before or after the kids were kidnapped? She said, look, you need to have a worry hour in your life. Try to remember that you are in charge of your thoughts as much as possible and your feelings, and you're going to indulge in breakdowns and crying and talking about it and just feeling bad and even sometimes feeling sorry for yourself for an entire hour out of the day. But the other 23, those have to be meaningful and dedicated to things that are going to propel you forward. And that was exceptionally helpful. Mm, I like that. Yeah. I, I, yeah. So that we're not, you know, just continually, you know, stuck in that sort of victim mentality, you know, but we're, we're doing things to empower ourselves. I loved it. Exactly. I mean, I agree, Melissa. And the other thing is if... All of us have known someone who's gone through maybe a divorce or a family member has passed or something horrible, some trauma, but maybe they don't know that there is support groups or a therapist or someone to compartmentalize and get that support and help. Mm -hmm. And so it's wonderful to go to their friends and be able to and family and vent all of that. 
but there comes a time if every conversation is taken hostage by that person's trauma that people sort of back away and their support system starts inexplicably shrinking. And that can happen even if it's as dramatic as having kidnapped daughters. It, frankly, other people's lives matter too and their traumas and what they're going through. And so it was a good reminder also to compartmentalize, to get help where I could seek it, to absolutely access my support system, but not drive them insane in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So important. Um, And I want to hear more about, you know, things that have helped you. Um, But just to kind of go back a little bit first. So I know you said that the challenge was really after you came back with your daughters. And I want to hear a little bit more about what that was like and, and how you were you know, affected by that. Absolutely. When I came home with my daughters, it was a fabulous few hours. And then within, I'd say, six hours, their father was notified from, because the news had run uh, footage of us returning home, the news uh, programs, that we were back in uh, Alaska. And so the threat started immediately. We had 24 hours hadn't passed when he started threatening uh, pretty horrible things. And so it just didn't last long before I already felt scared. And could this happen again? Or could we be killed? My daughters were so excited at the hero's welcome they received, but they were overwhelmed also because they didn't speak English by the time that I had reunited with them. Mm -hmm. And so they, they were getting a grasp of their English and now they had adorable Greek accents, but everything had changed in their world. Uh, Even where we lived, I had had to move and, you know, now they were having to go to school because I'd run out of personal leave, all of that. But I started losing my, for lack of better term, losing my marbles. And so a couple of times I saw really scary visions. Like I was driving home from work and saw a dinosaur just on the side of the road, which I nearly crashed the car. It was so real and so terrifying. Oh. And another time I was taking a shower and the walls started closing in on me. So it looked like I was going to be squashed by the tile. And so I had to come to terms with the fact that I had to go to a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And there I just was diagnosed with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And there was some, because I have a family history anyhow of pretty significant mental health Uh, issues and anxiety, there was some thought that I had sort of classic bipolar disorder that perhaps this would go on and on and on and on, these psychotic symptoms. And while absolutely I have a mood disorder, it turned out that over time, getting that support, getting that help and the passage of time and routine and self-care, some of the dysfunction and the symptoms started to shrink. But as you can imagine, I had two traumatized children and now I wasn't in any great shape to take care of them. Mm. I was a hot mess. Yeah. So yeah. you were, you were dealing with your own things and they were struggling. With right. Traumas. Mm-hmm. Even when they looked at me the next morning, <laughs> when I woke up the next morning, I did not recognize them. And I write about this in the book. Like I thought there are two children in very close proximity, staring at me, in my, and I'm in my bed, my own bed. I'm like, what do they want? Why are they here? And then when I started piecing it together, and it was so scary, but when I pieced it together, and then I realized, oh, they think I can make them food. Like, I would be able to just go down and make them food, and I just, it was as though some magnetic force had come and erased basic memory and things from me at different times. And I would have bouts of, you know, really horrible anger and frustration and irritability before the diagnosis. And then once the diagnosis came, I certainly felt much more like, okay, well, there is a name for my crazy. And this doesn't have to decimate my life, but it definitely at the moment is defining it. Mm. And so I'll deal with that and, and get the help that I need. But, but this, this was a scary time. So when the children got enough language, so I would say three to six months after they came home, when their health issues had been taken care of, because they had some health problems that uh, they 
they had experienced a lot in Greece and they experienced a lot of neglect by their father. And so there were some things that were more critical to address. And then when they had enough language, I put them back into therapy and certainly I was in therapy, but that was just the beginning. There came a point in their lives though. And it, I would say within a year, if you met my children in 1997 or 1998, all you would think was, what amazing, adorable, and well-mannered girls. Uh, you would never have guessed that they had gone through anything horrible whatsoever. And so I, I thought as a young parent who really implemented a lot of old school dogma in my parenting, you know, I truly believed like, hey, I'm not going to feel sorry for my kids. And nobody else should either. You know, they've, they've been the recipient of uncommon kindness. And that it is true. They really were that so many people, not just in Alaska, but in Greece and around the world had helped to bring them home. So they will live wonderful, productive lives. And I won't expect less of them as a parent because they've gone through something awful. And that may not sound all bad, but it put a lot of pressure on them. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize it at the time, but it, it, I, it sort of had the mentality of like, hey, girls, don't look at how many people did nice things for you. Can you invent the cure to AIDS? Because you've been through so much and, and they did so much to get you back. That would be a great way to pay them back. And I'm, I'm being facetious, but it was kind of that pressure that sort of like, I, you know, will you be a scientist? Maybe the president? I don't know. Something mm -hmm. great is going to come from this. Right. And so I really had uh, big expectations and they did really well, like grade wise soon. They did sports. They had friends, lots of some wonderful male role models in their lives. Even if I didn't remarry, they, we still have wonderful men in our friendship community. I got to know my own family better on my dad's side during this time. And that was amazing and got to piece more of my own personal story together. And then when my kids hit teenage years, especially when my oldest daughter was, went away to college on a partial scholarship in, in Washington State, that's when it just all came unstitched. And so here we were, a decade almost, it felt like, yeah, I'm going to say she was 18, 19. Yes, yeah, so it was a decade later. And that forced separation from me mm. with her out of state in college created a snap and her gentle and very delicate mental health and her traumatized little soul that you could practically hear in Anchorage. And mm -hmm. that was the beginning of the end of who I knew to be my daughter. That was a, a remarkable change occurred that would never be, you know, restored fully. So oh. I had to learn a lot at that point that, I started learning and becoming a trainer of trauma-informed care at my work. I had a graduate degree in psychology now and started, I became a teacher of trauma-informed care and of the adverse childhood experiences study. And that so helped me knowing what I had done wrong in my parenting and things that, some things I couldn't control, but some things I did, I could have done better and differently. Yeah, but of course, you know, I mean, children. we do the best that we can do at the time true. with what we know. Very true. Very true. It was a game changer. And even then, to be able to come clean to my daughter later when she, because she was like a little kid again, after that happened, she could not live independently, go to college or work for a couple of years. Um, it wasn't a small thing. This was consistent, lasting impact on her and she at first was developmentally a little girl again and so as we both came together in in therapy and in healing to be able to come and say to her I'm so sorry that I didn't see this happening or if my pressure or expectations was that instead of saying what's wrong with you I should have been asking what happened to you what happened to you Mm. And I think that's the whole premise of trauma-informed care that was just such a game changer. It was like, it's not, and I always had this in the back of my head, even when I was bullied in school in a different, a couple of different uh, times really horribly, I used to think as a little kid, I wonder, I know what I'm going through. I wonder what they're going through to be so mean. 
Right. But if we can right. look at one another and think what happened to you, instead of seeing a slew of symptoms and deficits and problems and all of that, but, but what happened to you? Uh, it's so it true. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it what, is so true. what, you know, oftentimes people are not stopping and asking that question and trying to find out what is the real issue here. You know, we're just right. looking at what we see on the surface and criticizing for that, but without going deeper to understand what the real problem is so that we can help that person. Exactly. Exactly. And, and knowing too, that in our loneliness that trauma brings, that bullying can bring, that many things bring us, that feeling of being a misfit, that all around us, no matter how successful or amazing someone might appear on the surface, they do have their own story. And they may be going through a lot that we just don't know or give them credit for. And we're not alone in our lone, aloneness. And I think that that's really a message that I want people to understand. It's like if they feel totally alone, A, they're not. There are people willing to reach out and hold their hand or give them just enough support so they make it to that next step. And that's, that's why I love the, the title of your podcast, the, Get, the, the Grass Gets Greener. And I would say that, yes, it does get greener. And it gets greener with a lot of work. Mm -hmm. and a lot of support and a lot of life experience, but it really does get greener. Yeah, I like to think so. And um, it just, it, I can hear how important support has been in your healing and for your daughters as well. And it sounds like that the three of you have just done a lot of your healing together and been able to help each other through these situations that you've been going through. Thank you. And we are like a little tribe of three. And now our family has expanded, of course, because one of the best things I ever gave myself was the permission to look for this father of mine that had been so denigrated by my mom. Um, so I reunited with him when I was young, when I was 20. But then I got to know the family. He had already passed away early after I met him. So when I was able to afford it, probably when I was 40, I started getting to know my family, my extended family in Kentucky and my family in Indiana and all over the place. And just being strong enough to feel like, you know what, no matter who I meet or what they've been through, it's not going to change who I am. So I won't come at them with expectations of dependency, but I'll get to know a little bit more and feel proud no matter who they are, that they're mine. And that's been really wonderful. And my kids and I, we love each other, see each other in constant contact, but we have plenty of dysfunction left <laughs> in our relationship. So I don't want to sugarcoat things. Like this has not been a perfect story. I am not a perfect mother. And just yesterday I did something that so upset my oldest daughter and just really triggered her anxiety. Mm. And uh, I posted a picture of her um, on a social media. And it was I hadn't asked permission, but I didn't mean to tag her. But I'm not smart on social media. So somehow <laughs> or not, I have it to where when I post things, like she gets tagged in all kinds of stupid things. That I have <laughs> to and she's like, you know, sent me this text when I was at a movie, like, Mom, I wish you wouldn't do that. And it's really made me angry. And when I talked to her later, like it took her day out. Like it literally, she balled up into a mess. Uh, and so I, you know, we still are, but not perfect, but we do talk and we do try. And when we argue, we try to come back quickly and take responsibility for, for whatever it was um, as quickly as possible. And then we try to be forgiving because we've all been through a lot. Right. Yeah. So how are you doing today, Elizabeth? And are there any things that you still... You know, sort of struggle with as a result of everything you've been through? Definitely, definitely. And thank you for asking. I am, I feel like in general, like I am 54 years old now. I, you know, eventually had got a graduate degree and changed uh, work from just victims of domestic violence, which I loved that job. Still the coworkers from that job are some of my best friends. That was many, you know, decades ago. Then I went to investigate child abuse. Um, for the state of Alaska, I was a child abuse, you know, a social worker. And from that, I moved forward to with the work that I do now, working with delinquent youth uh, for 20 years now. 
uh, for the state of Alaska, working with juveniles who've been definitely impacted by trauma, most all of them, not all of them, most of them. Trauma is unspeakable that I couldn't even imagine having experienced and working with them to try to repair the harm done to victims and to our community. And so I've always had meaningful, amazing work, and I have fabulous friends. And I live in my tiny little starter home that's really not that tiny, that, that I always thought I would sell and upgrade. And, you know, honestly, instead, I've taken great pride of renovating it. And so I have a very supportive neighborhood. And I've taken to, when I do have extra money, like, Going across the globe, I think the one thing that happened with me after our lives stabilized so much and I, I, when the kids were younger before the, the real trauma hit as they became teenagers, but there was a period of time where I'd finished my graduate degree, everything was going well, had a job with pension and medical benefits, which I hadn't had. And I became so sad. I, I couldn't figure out what happened. Like every, everything I tried to work for, I had. And I was just so dissatisfied, but I truly believe my brain be does need a little bit of chaos. <laughs> and so as soon as I could do it, I started going to travel the globe by myself, oh. you know, in my mm -hmm. 40s. So I just started, the first trip I went to was Vietnam and Laos. And then I went to Australia and I went to France and Italy, where I saw one of my friends who I love, Popey who helped me, my Greek friend who helped me, she's now living in Italy. And so I got to see her after so many years. And recently I went to South America and Uruguay and Buenos Aires. And it is always really scary, but mm -hmm. it reminds me that I can land on my feet and that I truly enjoy meeting people and opening my heart and having designated time to do that. Mm. And so in those ways, really, really well. And I, like I said, I can retire from my particular job as a juvenile probation supervisor in a year, just over a year. I may stay a little longer, but it's really meaningful. I train new employees on trauma-informed care, I, uh, on the adverse childhood experiences, on mental health. And then, of course, I wrote my book a couple of years ago. And Well, I wrote it. took 20 years, but launched it a couple of years ago. And that has provided me with so many opportunities to talk on wonderful podcasts such as this or do news interviews, all of that. And I continue to write a novel and then a self-help book right now is what I'm working on. But I just love that about my life. And I'm looking forward to what comes next. Where I struggle is I just have never quite at all. I've dated wonderful men, wonderful, quality, kind, empathetic, funny men. But I think when it comes to relationships, I'm still flooded with, I remember once trusting someone and my life changed forever. And what will this person do? And no matter how kind they are, how wonderful, how supportive, ultimately I put on my tennis shoes and run. Mm -hmm. And so it hasn't been, it hasn't been, the only running I've ever done is when I start dating. But uh, anyway, I, you know, I really, uh, that is still a struggle and who knows what the future holds. Maybe that will change, but, but that is still the leftover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I can understand how that would, you know, be there for you as something that you struggle with. Um, but I, I love that, you know, you're doing well and I love that you've, uh, that you love to travel and are doing that, you know, by yourself. And that's, that is a scary thing. I uh, traveled to Europe by myself when I was in my early twenties and it was such a great experience, but you know, also one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had probably. Thank you. Yes, it is, isn't it? It is because you know, if something goes wrong, if you break your ankle on the sidewalk, if someone steals your passport, it's just you, you know, it is just you. You cannot reach your family to be there for you in like five hours or something. And so it is exhilarating and terrifying. And there is something about that that I truly love. It is my dream to publish an anthology of older solo women travelers who were single moms and then finally were able to uh, launch their own dream as their kids became grown. That is just a huge dream for me. And so I do mm. blog. I uh, have a website at lameredith.com where I blog a couple of times a month. 
and I love to hear from readers. I do. And I do Skype book groups and things like that. And I, I don't know, it has been a joy. I just never expected that my memoir would connect me with so many wonderful men and women. That's awesome. Yeah. So sounds good, Elizabeth. Thank you for you know sharing uh, where people, how people can connect with you. Um, and I do want to ask you the final question that I have for you today. And that is, given what you know now, if you could go back to when you're going through your tough times and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? I have such a good question that I love on your podcast. And I feel like it would be definitely to keep in mind the message we've spoken about, that the grass does get greener or it can get greener with a whole lot of support and work. And even finding that support is work, but that it is absolutely possible to heal and incorporate trauma into our life. And the best part is being able to double back and then reach out and be that hand that someone else can grab. So I, it, there is a, so much to look forward to. And I would tell my younger self exactly that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. And I love just how, you know, we can go from, from our struggles and the traumas that we've experienced to getting to a place where we can help others. And I think that's such a great thing because it, it really helps those out there who are going through their own struggles right now, just to, as you said, you know, we are not alone in our aloneness. Right. Know? We have, we have others out there um, that we can turn to for support, um, which is a great thing. So yeah, I love it. And um any other ways that people can connect with you that you wanted to mention before I let you go? Absolutely. I'm on Facebook. I have an author page and I also am on Twitter at Elizabeth Meredith. So I love to hear from readers and from people who are just interested in talking about the subjects we were speaking on today. And I adore that today there are podcasts such as yours that allow someone from the comforts of their own home to know that they're not alone. And I also looked at Novni that you, that helps sponsor sometimes your mm -hmm. program. And that I gave that referral to my oldest daughter and oh, nice. my kids, by the way, both adult daughters are 30 and 31 now and live in Anchorage and just said to sweetie, you know, here's something that is affordable for therapy, but also to write anonymously. Mm. It's such a great thing to journal, or if you don't feel comfortable with that, write anonymously on Novni. What a healing thing it can be to have somewhere to put the, these feelings and things that we all go through. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I hope that will be helpful for them. So yeah, great. And where can people uh, find your book? They can find pieces of me rescuing my kidnapped daughters anywhere that books are sold. It is online at different venues. It's an audio book paperback and ebook. So certainly a person can order it through their local retailer to support their independent bookstore. They can get it through Barnes and Noble, but they may have to order it. Sometimes they automatically have them. And certainly on Amazon, it is for sale as well. And thank you. Yeah, sounds good. So if anyone, you know, is interested in hearing more about your story, then they can read about that there in your memoir. So sounds good. Um, so, Elizabeth, I just want to thank you for coming on here today and for sharing your journey with us and just providing us with that hope and inspiration that things can get better. So thank you for that. I thank you for this opportunity and for all you do to help all of us heal, uh, Melissa. I really do. I think it's just such a wonderful meeting place to have right here at a podcast and that you have so many different guests that people will find someone who resonates with them. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening to the show today. This has been the Grass Gets Greener podcast, episode 154. Go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Lizbeth Meredith, and that's L-I-Z-B-E-T-H. So find the links mentioned during this episode or to leave a comment. So I hope you enjoyed this episode with Lizbeth today and have been inspired by it. And I want to reiterate a message that she shared here, and that is that you are not alone in your aloneness. And I know it can feel that way sometimes when you're suffering and struggling, but the fact of the matter is that you are not. And that's one of the main reasons why I do this show is so that you know that you are not alone in what you're going through and that there's hope for things to get better. 
And sometimes just knowing that can make a huge difference. But also if you have someone that you can reach out to for support or perhaps there's a support group that you can turn to, then I definitely encourage you to do that if you're feeling alone and feeling like you could use some support in your journey. And of course, be sure to come back for the next episode for more inspiration. And also head over to the website to grab your free copy of the Top 10 Strategies Guide for Survivors. In it, you'll find the top 10 most common strategies my podcast guests have used for overcoming the effects of past trauma. It's a great place to get started if you're looking for some strategies that can help you in your healing as they have helped my guests. And you can find that at thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash guide or also on the show notes page. So be sure to grab that if you haven't yet. And lastly, don't forget to head over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave the show rating and review so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. And as always, have hope. Have hope.